Hi students, in this video, we will review the August 2022 Algebra 1 Regents. This video will contain all the solutions that require minimal to no calculator usage. Go ahead and grab a notebook and a pencil and let's get started. For question number one, it states if f of x equals 3x plus 4 divided by 2, then f of 8 is. So essentially, we are evaluating what is the value of y when x equals 8. So we will replace x with 8 so that we can understand and calculate what the output value is. So f of 8 equals 3 times 8 plus 4, all divided by 2. That is f of 8 equals 3 times 8 is 24 plus 4, all divided by 2. So f of 8 equals 28 divided by 2. Our final answer is 14. The correct answer is choice three. Number two, if x equals zero, then the common ratio of the sequence x comma 2x squared comma 4x to the third power comma 8x to the fourth power comma 16x to the fifth power is, we are looking for the common ratio here. Recall that common ratio is a term that's associated with geometric sequences, which means any term divided by the preceding term is going to give us our common ratio. For instance, a sub n plus one divided by a sub n is equal to r, the common ratio. Let's calculate. 2x squared divided by x equals 2x. 4x cubed divided by 2x squared equals, let's cancel out. 2 divided by 2 is 1. 4 divided by 2 is 2. x squared divided by x squared is 1. And x cubed divided by x squared is x. So we have 2x for this quotient. 8x to the fourth power divided by 4x cubed. When we cancel out, we're also going to have 2x. So it's clear that the common ratio is 2x. The correct answer is choice one. Number three, the expression 3x to the second power minus nine is equivalent to, in our previous videos, we shared with you that anytime you see the phrase is equivalent to, the question is asking you to factor. Let's think about our three factoring techniques. We have factoring out the greatest common factor. I do notice that both 36 and nine share a common factor of nine. So that's one option. We also have the difference of two perfect squares. I noticed that there's a subtraction symbol here and 36 X squared is a perfect square and nine is a perfect square. Our last factoring technique is trinomial factoring, but this is definitely not a trinomial. So for this problem, we're gonna go with the difference of two perfect squares. We set up our two parentheses. We know that one of them will have an addition symbol and the other one would have a subtraction symbol. We're gonna go ahead and find the square root of the first term here. The square root of 36 is six and the square root of x squared is x. We have six x over here and six x over here. The square root of nine is three and three. So we have six x plus three and six x minus three. So the correct answer is choice three. Given the relation r equals negative four comma two, three comma six, x comma eight and negative one comma four, which value of x would make this relation a function? Remember, our quick definition for functions is that x values don't repeat. Remember that, x values don't repeat. So I know if we're going to add a new x value here, it cannot be negative four, it cannot be three, it cannot be negative one, but it can be zero because zero does not show up in any of the other coordinate points. Remember, a relation is a function if x values don't repeat. For question number five, it's very similar to number one. If the point k comma negative five lies on the line whose equation is three x plus y equals seven, then the value of k is? For question number one, we were given the value of x and we needed to find the value of y. For this question, we are given the value of y and we need to find the value of x. So let's go ahead and replace y with negative five. We have three x plus negative five equals seven. 
we can go ahead and perform the inverse operation. So I will add five on both sides. We now have 3x equals 12. 3x equals 12 is simply a one-step equation. So we can go ahead and divide by three on both sides and we have x equals four. So choice four is the correct answer. Number six, the expression one-third x times six x squared minus three x plus nine is equivalent to, in this case, we don't need to factor, but we do need to perform the distributive property to find an equivalent expression. Let's get started. When we distribute one third x to each of the terms in the parentheses, let's see what we have. One third times six is two. X times x squared is x cubed. One third times negative three is negative one. X times x is x squared. One third times nine is three. And we're just gonna hold on to the x. So we have two x cubed minus one x squared plus three x. We don't technically need the one there. So I'm gonna rewrite that one more time for us. We have two X cubed minus X squared plus three X. So the correct answer is choice three. Number seven, the graphs below represent four polynomial functions. Which of these functions has zeros of two and negative three? Remember, zeros are also known as roots. They're also known as solutions. They're also known as x-intercepts, which means these are the points where the graph, in this case, the parabola, or also known as the quadratic function, is crossing the x-axis. So we would like to see when that's happening. In answer choice one, the parabola is crossing the x-axis at negative two and three. So the zeros for answer choice one is negative two and three, and that is not what we're looking for. For answer choice two, the zeros are negative three and negative two. Negative three is right here and negative two. Again, that is not what we're looking for. Answer choice three, the zeros are negative three and two. That looks to be correct. And for answer choice four, the zeros are two and three. That looks to be incorrect. So answer choice three is the correct answer. What is the constant term of the polynomial 4D plus six plus 3D squared? Let's recall the definition of a constant term. It is a term with no variable, right? No X, Y, A, B, C, or D, and it's only a number. So when we take a look at this polynomial over here, it's clear that six is the term with no variable and it's simply a number by itself. So that is the correct answer. Number nine, Emily was given $600 for her high school graduation. She invested it in an account that earns 2.4% interest per year. If she does not make any deposits or withdrawals, which expression can be used to determine the amount of money that will be in the account after four years? So we know that four is our time factor. This is consistent across all four answer choices. We also know that 600 is our principal or initial value. This number is also consistent across all four answer choices. We should also pay attention to what's happening in the problem. She is investing this money. Anytime you invest money and you are earning interest on an annual basis, that means your money should be going up, which means we're looking for an addition operation. So automatically we can go ahead and eliminate answer choice four and answer choice two because there is a subtraction operation. For answer choice one and three, the only difference is how the actual interest rate is showing up. Remember, our goal is to convert the percent into a decimal. We're going to move the decimal point two places to the left. That's one and then two. We typically have to divide by 100 when converting a percent into a decimal. So the decimal equivalent would be 0 0.024. So the correct answer is choice three. Number 10, different ways to represent data are shown below. We have a dot plot here, we have a box and whisker plot, and we have a histogram. Which data representations have a median of two? The easiest representation to determine a median 
is actually the box and whisker plot. We can see that the middle number right here is two. So that is always going to be the median. So I know for sure that the correct answer has to have choice two in it. So let's see what we can eliminate. So the only one we can eliminate so far is choice two. Let's check out the dot plot. There are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 data points in total, which means we're going to have 7 and 7, and then the number right in the middle, which is the eighth point, is going to be the median. So we can count starting from the left or from the right. We should still end up at the same answer. Let's count together to find the eighth data point. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the eighth data point is going to be a two. So we know for sure that the median for the dot plot is two. So we can eliminate answer choice three because it has omitted the dot plot as one of the answers. And we know for sure that the median for one and two is both two. For the histogram, we have one, two, three, four, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 data points. So we're going to have 10 and 10, and the data point right in the middle, which is the 11th data point, is going to be the median. So let's count. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. It's going to fall somewhere around here. So the median for this histogram is actually three, not two. So the correct answer is choice one. The dot plot and the box and whisker plot both have a median of two. Let's keep going. Question number 11. What would be the order of these quadratic functions when they are arranged from the narrowest graph to the widest graph? Remember, the narrower the graph, the higher the coefficient. For instance, let's say 10x squared is going to look something like this. The wider the graph, the smaller the coefficient. So let's say y equals 0.1x squared. It's going to look something like this. So the question is asking us to go from narrowest to widest, which is actually negative 5. Now, I know you're probably like, isn't negative five less than three? But we have to think about the absolute value because even if it's going down, it's still very narrow. So we wanna think about the absolute value of the coefficient, whatever that number is, it must be the largest. So the narrowest here is gonna be f of x. So that could be answer choice one or four. Then right behind that is going to be h of x. So that's gonna be choice four. And then 0 0.5 is gonna be the widest. So that must come last. So the correct answer is choice four. Number 12, at Berkeley Central High School, a survey was conducted to see if students preferred cheeseburgers, pizza, or hot dogs for lunch. The results of this survey are shown in the table below. Based on this survey, what percent of the students preferred pizza? Let's calculate how many students we have in total. So four plus four is eight, plus two is 10. So I'm gonna put the zero, carry the one. And then we have two plus four is six plus three is nine, plus one is 10. So we have 100 females in total. For the males, four plus six is 10. We have zero, we're gonna carry the one. Three plus three is six, plus three is nine, plus one is 10. So there are also 100 males. So in total, we have 200 students between the males and the females. The question is, what percent of all of the students, which is out of 200, prefer pizza. So what's the total amount of students who prefer pizza? We can add up these two amounts. 44 plus 30 is 74. So the question is, what is 74 over 200 expressed as a percent? Remember, percent means per 100 or out of 100. So the easiest thing for us to do is to divide both the numerator and the denominator by two. That's going to give us a denominator of 100. 7 divided by 2 is 3, remainder 1, and 14 divided by 2 is 7. So this is actually 37%. So the correct answer is choice 2. Which situation could be modeled by a linear function? Remember, for linear functions, we're adding or subtracting the same amount every single time. 
adding or subtracting. Let's look at answer choice one. The value of a car depreciates by 7% annually. That's gonna be multiplying by 0.07 every year. That sounds like an exponential function to me. Let's check out choice two. A gym charges a $50 initial fee and then $30 monthly. So you have $50 to begin with and then you're adding $30 every single month. That sounds like a linear function to me. That would be the correct answer. Let's keep going though. The number of bacteria in a lab doubles weekly. To double means you're multiplying by two every single time. Sounds like an exponential function to me. <laughs> and answer choice four, the amount of money in a bank account increases by 0.1% monthly. Again, we'll be multiplying by 0 0.001 every single month. So that's also an exponential function. Choice two is the correct answer. Number 14. Which function has the smallest y-intercept value? The y-intercept is going to be the point where x is zero, and then we have some sort of y value. So you're asking yourself, what is y when x is zero? Let's take a look at our answer choices. For answer choice one, the y-intercept is zero comma one, because when x is zero, y is one. For answer choice two, h of zero, which means x is going to be zero, is the square root of zero minus three. Since the square root of zero is zero, zero minus three is negative three. So we have the point zero, negative three as our y-intercept. For answer choice three, it's clear that the y-intercept is negative two. So we have zero comma negative two. And for answer choice four, we have f of zero equals zero squared, plus two times zero minus one. So F of zero equals negative one. So the y-intercept is zero comma negative one. Out of all of these y-intercept values, the smallest number here is negative three. So choice two is the correct answer. Number 15. When solving x squared minus 10x minus 13 equals zero by completing the square, which equation is a step in the process? Let's go ahead and solve by completing the square. x squared minus 10x minus 13 equals zero. Step one when completing the square is to move the C term to the right. So we're gonna add 13 on both sides. So we have x squared minus 10x, leave some space over here, equals 13. Then we're going to add B over two squared to both sides. So what is B? B is negative 10 divided by two, and then we're gonna square it. Negative 10 divided by two is negative five, and negative five squared is 25. So let's go ahead and add 25 to both sides. We now have x minus five squared, because I went ahead and factored the left-hand side, equals 38. Guys, let's just take a second to go over how I got x minus five squared. When you go ahead and factor this trinomial, right, you're going to have two numbers that can multiply to get x squared, that's x times x. And what two numbers, when you multiply, you get 25, but when you add, you get negative 10. When you multiply, you get 25, but when you add, you get negative 10. That's negative five times negative five is positive 25, and negative five plus negative five is negative 10 but it's much easier to express this as a perfect square. So it becomes X minus five squared. The beautiful thing about this problem is they don't really want us to find the final answer. This is sufficient for this problem. So we know that the final answer is choice one. X minus five squared equals 38. Let's keep going. Number 16, when three X squared plus seven X minus six plus two X cubed is written in standard form, the leading coefficient is, Let's talk about what is a leading coefficient. The leading coefficient is the number to the left of the term with the biggest exponent. So let's take a look at our polynomial. As I'm scanning through here, I notice that the term with the biggest exponent is positive two X cubed. So what's the number to the left? It's positive two. That's going to be our leading coefficient. So when we actually write this in standard form, we would have two X cubed, plus three X squared plus seven X minus six. But since positive two starts off our polynomial, 
that is our leading coefficient. Which of the equations below have the same solution? Let's go ahead and solve. For the first problem, we're going to perform the distributive property. We have 10 times x and 10 times negative 5. So 10x minus 50 equals negative 15. We can add 50 on both sides. So 10x equals 35 and x equals 3.5. That is the value of x for answer choice one. Let's look at answer choice two. We're gonna distribute two times x and two times negative two. So four plus two x minus four equals nine. These fours are gonna cancel out. So we have two x equals nine and x equals 4.5. So already we're seeing that these two x values are not the same. For this last problem, anytime you have a fractional coefficient, the easiest thing to do is to multiply both sides by the reciprocal. Why is that? Three over one times one over three, we would end up having three times one is three, and one times three is three, and three divided by three is technically one. So for this equation, we would have x equals nine over two, which is 4.5. So number two and three have the same solution. So the correct answer is choice three. Number 19, in the process of solving the equation 10x squared minus 12x minus 16 equals six, George wrote two times 5x squared minus 14x equals two times three, followed by 5x squared minus 14x equals three. Which properties justify George's process? If we take a look at the difference between the original equation and what George wrote here, this is technically the distributive property, but just in reverse. If George were to combine negative 12x and negative 16x, he would have had 10x squared minus 28x equals six. And then he went ahead and factored out the common terms. So you factor out a two, and you have 5x squared minus 14x equals two times three. So this is basically the distributive property in reverse, right? If we were to multiply, we would go ahead and get the 10x squared minus 28x, but by factoring out the GCF, it's just the reverse of the distributive property. So that's one of the properties that can justify George's process, the distributive property. The next property is uh, I notice there are twos here and then those twos somehow disappear. So the only operation we can do to have the twos disappear is to divide both sides of the equation by two. And these twos will cancel. So now we have five X squared minus 14 X equals three. So we call that the division property of equality. So the correct answer is choice four. Number 20. A sequence is defined recursively by a sub one equals negative two and a sub n equals three times a sub n minus one plus one. What is the value of a sub four, which is the fourth term in the sequence? Let's write out all the terms. a sub one equals negative two, a sub two equals three times negative two plus one. So we're simply taking the term that came right before it and adding it to the expression here three times negative two plus one, that gives us negative five. A sub three equals three times negative five plus one, which is negative 14. And finally, A sub four equals three times negative 14 plus one equals negative 41. So answer choice one is the correct answer. Number 21, a swimmer set a world record in the women's 500 meter freestyle finishing the race in 15.42 minutes. If one meter is approximately 3.281 feet, which set of calculations could be used to convert her speed to miles per hour? So she finished 1500 meters in 15.42 minutes. We know that we can convert minutes to hours. To solve these kinds of problems, we really want to cancel out the units. Don't even worry about the numbers, just look at the units. We wanna end up with miles in the numerator and hours in the denominator and every other unit has to cancel out. So I would like minutes to cancel out. So I'm looking for minutes to be in the numerator and then hours to be in the denominator. So I'm just gonna do a quick scan. And I noticed that answer choice one has 60 minutes over 
one hour. So the minutes are canceling out. That's happening in answer choice two. It's also happening in answer choice four, but I don't see it happening in answer choice three. So we're gonna eliminate that one. We also want meters to be converted into feet. We were given that conversion in the original problem. One meter is approximately 3.28 feet. So notice the meters are both in the numerator here. That's not gonna work for us because we can't cancel out the units when they're both in the numerator. We would need meters here in the numerator and meters in the denominator. So we're gonna get rid of answer choice one. Let's take a look at choice two. Do we have meters in the numerator and meters in the denominator? Yes, we do. So this is a potential answer and those meters are gonna cancel out. For answer choice four, again, we don't have meters in the numerator and in the denominator. So we're gonna get rid of that one. So it's pretty clear that answer choice two is correct, but let's just take a look. One meter is 3.281 feet. So that looks good. And now we would want feet to cancel out. So feet is going to cancel out here. It's in the numerator and it's in the denominator. So now take a look at what units are left. We have miles here in the numerator and that's the only unit that's left in the numerator. And we have hours here in the denominator. That's the only unit left here in the denominator. So answer choice two is the correct answer. The diagram below shows the graph of H of T, which models the height in feet of a rocket T seconds after it was shot into the air. The domain of H of T is, remember, the domain is the set of all possible X values. I prefer to use vertical lines to assess what's happening on the graph. So right now, if we draw a vertical line right here, we could tell that the X values start off at zero and we're going all the way to the right where the X values are ending at four. So the domain goes from zero to four. We also know that there are closed circles here at zero and four. So the domain is going from zero to four inclusive, meaning we're gonna include the zero and include the four. So we must use brackets. Answer choice two is the correct answer. Number 23, the table below shows the time in hours spent by students on electronic devices and their math test scores. The data collected model a linear regression. We have a table of values here. The input values are time spent on an electronic device recorded in hours, and then the output value are the math test scores. The question asks, what is the correlation coefficient to the nearest hundredth for these data. Now, of course, there's a manual way to solve this problem, but it's just not useful for the purposes of this course. So this is the one question out of the entire multiple choice section of the August 2022 regions where we must use a calculator. Let's head over to the TI-84 calculator. Before you get started working on linear regression problems, you have to remember to turn diagnostics on. There are two ways to do this. You can hit second zero and scroll all the way down to where you're gonna see diagnostics on and diagnostics off, and you're going to select diagnostics on. So let's take a look. It's right over here. You see how it says diagnostics off? We wanna go to diagnostics on and we're gonna press enter twice. So you see how it says done? That's what you're looking for. There's another approach that you can take. For the newer graphing calculators, you can press mode. And if you notice right down here, it says stat diagnostics off and on. So right now it's on. If you want to turn it off, you can just press off right here or you can go to on and turn it on. So those are the two ways, either press second zero and go down to diagnostics on or press mode and scroll down here to diagnostics on. So let's start our problem. You're gonna hit stat and number one is edit. So we're gonna press enter. All of our input values are going to be entered into L1. So we have three, one, four, zero, three, seven, five, and two. Be very careful not to make any mistakes when entering these data points. Our output values or Y values are gonna be math test scores and we're gonna enter it in L2. We have 85, 99, 81, 98, 90, 65, 78, and 90. We are done. 
Now we want to calculate some statistics about this data set. To calculate the correlation coefficient, you're gonna hit stat, go over to calc, so that's arrow right, and then we're going to hit linreg ax plus b, which is number four, and we're gonna press enter. The x list is L1, the y list is L2. We're gonna go all the way down to calculate. And now we have the linear regression equation where it says y equals ax plus b. This is our slope, which is gonna replace a. This is our y-intercept, which will replace b. r squared and r. This is the information we're looking for for the correlation coefficient. So we're not interested in r squared. We are interested in just r by itself and pay attention to what they told us to do. They told us to round to the nearest hundredths place. So we see that it's going to be negative. So I'm eliminating answer choice three and four, and then negative 0.977, if we're rounding to the nearest hundredths place, this seven is going to round to an eight. So this is negative 0 0.98. So the correct answer is choice one, negative zero, 0.98. Number 24. The volume of a trapezoidal prism can be found using the formula V equals one half A, open parentheses, B plus C, close parentheses, times H. Which equation is correctly solved for B? This means we want to isolate B. Let's get started. My first goal here would be to get rid of the one half. So right now, again, anytime you're multiplying by a fraction, the easiest step is to multiply by the reciprocal. So I'll multiply both sides of this equation by two over one, and that's gonna cancel out there. So now we have two V equals, I'm gonna put the A and the H together because they're simply being multiplied times B plus C, which is in the parentheses. So my next step would be to divide both sides by AH because we wanna undo that multiplication bond. Let's see what we're left with. Now we have 2V over AH equals B plus C. Our final step is to subtract C on both sides. So our final answer should be B equals 2V over AH minus C. So the correct answer is choice four. In this video, we were able to solve 23 out of 24 of these questions without using the graphing calculator. We definitely needed the TI-84 calculator for number 23, but notice for every other question, we were able to do it without the calculator. So I challenge you to go ahead and learn and master these strategies so you don't have to be so calculator dependent. But for those of you who do prefer the calculator, 